So what you tend not to know about your professors, or not to, to think about mostly, some of you might, is that, um, is that we dabble in writing as well. I mean, that's, that's kind of a thing that most professors do, is they do some kind of research. And for those of us in the humanities and biblical and theological studies, we write stuff. We write articles, we write book reviews, sometimes we even write books. Um, it's a funny thing, because you don't want to be like a, a, a stuffed shirt or a big-headed kind of a scholar. But you also want to share stuff that you've done, um, partly because you did it and you feel good about it, and also partly because y you do it because you think it, it might help. It might um, serve uh, God's work in the world, um, and you've done this kind of concerted work. So one thing you'll see, I think more and more as the years go on from us, is you'll see us doing lectures that are doubling as something like a book launch, and that's kind of what we're doing uh, tonight for Dr. Johnson. Um, I'm here because uh, we're buddies. Uh, I'm also here because it's more fun to have two people talking about stuff than just one person saying, if you notice in page 87 in my book, we have this, this kind of a thing. Um, that, was a good, that was a good page. You like that? Well, it's, it's a very good page. Um, and uh, uh, it's just, it's more fun that way. I think you guys are, are liable to learn uh, a bit more uh, about the atonement. Um, we've done this before, too. We've got a group of guys who meet about once a year to talk about the atonement in the hippest parts of LA. This is actually true. And we uh, kind of had a good two or three hours worth of conversation on uh, Adam's recent book. So um, can I pray for us real quick, and then we'll get started? Father, thank you. Uh, well, gosh, thank you so much, uh, more than anything, uh, for the gift of your son who lived and died and was raised from the dead, who sat down at the right hand of the Father on high in the holy place, having finished his work, who intercedes for us at your right hand, even as we sit here talking in the comfort uh, of this auditorium, and who promises to come again. We wait for him um, with gratitude for his first coming and eager longing for his final coming. Bless our time together. Help us understand something more of his atoning work uh, because of our time together tonight. And thank you particularly for Adam, your servant. Bless him in his work. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to do this uh, sort of interview style, uh, fairly open-ended, um, but I'm going to act as interviewer, and Adam Johnson will act as interviewee. Um, he writes green books, as you can see, uh, for T&T Clark. Uh, these are both written uh, for T&T Clark. This is, uh, was the dissertation, uh, but became God's Being and Reconciliation, the Theological Basis of the Unity and Diversity of the Atonement and the Theology of Karl Barth. Uh, that's where he started. Uh, more recently, uh, this is the book we're going to mostly be talking about tonight, Atonement, A Guide for the Perplexed in the Series uh, with T&T Clark. Uh, he's also finishing editing uh, another T&T Clark. Will it be green? We can only hope. Gray. Gray, will it? I'm sorry. Okay. Green and gray is a nice combo. It is. Um, uh, T.T. Clark's Companion to the Doctrine of the Atonement, or is it just Companion to the Atonement? Companion to the Atonement. Companion to the Atonement will be a major uh, kind of resource companion uh, text. And he's written a recent, is it just an ebook on uh, wisdom theory of atonement? Or are you in no, the yeah, process? It's paper. I okay. submitted the manuscript November 1st. Oh, nice. Who's going to put that out? Uh, so, Logos. So. Logos Bible Software, if any of you have used that, they'll publish it digitally, and they also have a Lexum Press paper version of it, too. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, do you notice a theme? Yeah? Is it, is it hard to spot? Uh, atonement. So, I, Adam, I, I do want to start here. Why, why atonement? So, after, after college, I knew I wanted to be a professor. My experience was so formative uh, with my own professors here at Biola that I wanted to do the same thing in some way, investing in my students. Uh, but there was a problem with that. In order to be a professor, you had to get a PhD. <laughs> and I really I resented that <clears throat> because a PhD entails focusing on something, and I didn't want to focus. I wanted to study everything. <clears throat> uh, so I spent a lot of time uh, praying, talking with mentors, thinking about it. I was kind of leaning towards studying uh, ancient philosophy, doing a PhD in Plato studies, um, and uh, I was in Paul Spears' office uh, ta talking with him uh, one day, this is a couple years after graduating, and uh, 
You, you know those, um, those art displays where it's a pile of junk and then you move to the side and you look at it just right and it all aligns and it's like a picture of Abraham Lincoln or something like that? You, you, you've seen those like they slowly pan over on YouTube and then you, oh, it's, it's something. Well, as we were talking, that happened with my life. <laughs> and what was this big pile of junk became this you know, cohesive pattern of interest in books, conversations, movies, um, and, and things about the atonement that I didn't know I had, but I had had all along. And as that happened, I had the, the goosebumps and everything, and it was, okay, this is what I want to study for the rest of my life. So it just happened like that, and then I decided to do it Tory style and just started reading classics in the atonement. And that's all I've been doing ever since. See, the story I, I had heard and probably have told people is that Fred said, you should pick a doctrine. And you said, okay, I'll do atonement. That's obviously not the right story, or at least it's an <laughs> incredibly truncated version. Well, okay, so Fred did, me, did give me some formative advice along the way. There were two parts to it. He said, well, pick a major doctrine and pick a major figure. Uh, because then no matter what you're studying, you'll be able to weave those two things or one of those into your studies. So if you're doing a pastoral theology class, either you can do the pastoral theology of Karl Barth, or you can do pastoral theology and the doctrine of the atonement. So you can always be w working at those two core aspects of your thought, and then that gives you kind of a, a set of resources from which to explore other things. Um, so that happens somewhere in there. But this is, this is kind of nice, because I, I, I had thought of it as a little bit more of a pragmatic, I should no. pick a doctor, and he did Trinity, I'll do Atonement. This is more providential. No, 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 it's no, pretty this is, significant. Um, I, mean, I, I didn't hear a voice from God, but I, I felt God's direction in that. And it, was, it, was, it felt like a conversion experience. It was like, oh, no, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so no, it wasn't pragmatic at all. And I wish other people had the same experience, because... Uh, it's, it's somewhat, somewhat yeah, I mean, this, this stuff is worth attending to as you think about your lives. I, I think my stuff is mostly, it's I'm sure been providential, but I think I've mostly researched at whim. Um, I've, I've thought, oh, that's, this thing over here sounds fun. Yeah. This thing over here sounds fun, which is uh, neither better nor worse, but it's, I mean, it's good to get multiple models uh, in front of you for the kinds of things you do and why you do them. But um, I, I do tell people that I want to be the Fred Sanders Jr. of the atonement. Nice. So, <laughs> so yeah. Nice. I like that. Um, so, why another, why another book about the atonement? And not for you, like, why another book? You are accumulating them yes. yourself. But, um, so if you all have done any reading in uh, contemporary theology, 20th century theology, oh my gosh, could you fill, you have filled shelf after shelf after shelf of books on the atonement. They rehearse things over and over, and then people have increasingly sort of narrow and confined arguments that seem to be really just sort of rehashing the same old stuff. You could easily make an argument that, gosh, get on to something that people haven't been talking about. Why the atonement? Yeah. Um, all right, so, so if, if you're, wh whatever your hometown is, if, if you were to have a, a map of those areas which you had explored of your hometown, it'd be a funny looking map. Right? They're, they're, and especially if the areas that you traversed the most were the, like, the thickest, uh, the roads and the ones that you traverse the least were like really, really thin, like hairline trails. It, there would be certain streets that would be immensely thick because you've gone up and down them your whole life. Right beside it would be a street that was half as thick. And then three streets away is like no, is no man's territory and you've never even been there, right? even though it's your hometown. So you think, oh yeah, I know my hometown. But there are whole, whole neighborhoods that you've never been in. And if it's a big city, it's even more like that. Uh, so the doctrine of the atonement is a lot like that kind of map. Everyone's talked about it, but they've talked about certain questions that they think everyone is supposed to answer. So there'll be four, five, six questions that everyone tries to answer. Um, and uh, because there's well-established precedent for that, it's just really easy to fall into that groove. And as a result, they end up missing whole neighborhoods. Um, now, it, this, this gets, you know, with, with, to, to C.S. Lewis's little essay in the introduction to your Athanasius book, uh, where he's talking about reading old books. Uh, the new books all have the same ruts. And old books also have ruts, but they're different from the ruts of the new books. And it's, it's hard to spot your own ruts, but it's really easy to spot the ones that other people are in. Uh, so if all you're reading is 20th, 20th, 21st century stuff on the doctrine, then there are some very well-worn ruts that you don't even notice are, are ruts because you're so deeply in them. You just feel like you're in a canyon, and you don't know there's anything up above. You just figure it's desolate up there. Uh, reading, reading around in the history of theology, you start finding that this is immensely fertile 
uh, soil or, or really great neighborhoods. And um, so the, re the reason to, to write another book is exploring those less traversed areas of the doctrine. If, if, you, if you had only read 20th, 21st century theologies of the atonement, what, what would you have missed? What would you have not known about? This is sort of the reverse of our students who yeah. ha haven't really read any of that. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what would you have missed if you'd only read in 20th, 21st century? Excellent. Um, well, you'd, you'd have missed how, how broad the doctrine is because it feels a little small and stuffy. Hmm. Um, so, so opening the windows of the doctrine and to, to get the air from other centuries, it gets more lively. Um, so, you, so you'd be missing that. Um, you'd be missing a whole set of ways of thinking about the whole thing. So for example, Athanasius, when he thinks about the atonement early on and on the incarnation, he's thinking about it as a matter of God wanting to share his incorruptibility with us. Like what is a creature? The thing God has brought into existence in order to share his incorruptibility with. But the problem of sin is that we've fallen into, into corruption, so we're, we're moving toward decay. So what did God do? God became man, so the incorruptible took on corruption, so that by doing that, he could share with us the incorruptibility of God. Now that's a totally foreign way of thinking about the doctrine. It, it, it sounds vaguely familiar, but oddly strange. And the history of the doctrine is full of things like that. So it, it all sounds vaguely familiar, but once you start digging, you realize, oh wait, this is different, and there are a whole bunch of resources in here that I would just other, would have totally missed otherwise. If you, if you flip this, so for our students who are mostly reading old classic theology, it's the best stuff ever, yeah. but they're mostly reading that, they haven't read this 20th, 21st century okay. stuff, what might, is, maybe there's nothing that they're missing. Maybe it's all been said enough, oh, but is there anything no. they're missing from 20th, 21st century? Oh yeah, 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 there's a ton of stuff. Um, Reading 20th and 21st century theology helps you realize just how foreign the material is that you're reading from the previous centuries. So, so the, you know, the trick with theology is you know, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading, it all sounds vaguely familiar, it sounds somewhat biblical, it, you know, there are echoes of hymns and things in there, and you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And you don't stop to realize, whoa, 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 something really interesting just happened here. It's, it's the contrast between our own time and the past that helps bring out those differences so clearly. So that's one of the big things, uh, an, an example of that. Um, there's a whole bunch of language all throughout the history of the doctrine about the relation of the Father to the Son mm -hmm. on the cross. Yeah. And, the, and, and the Father sometimes is described as pouring out His wrath on the Son or punishing the Son or language like that, right? It's all pretty familiar. Um, so within the last 50 or so years, feminist theology has done a massive service to the church by saying, some of this language is incredibly problematic. Incredibly problematic. Like, um, pastors are actively using this to tell women or, or wives that you need to stay in this abusive situation because that's what the son did. The son took the wrath and punishment of the father in a way that was good and for our salvation. So you need to do the same thing. And you might think, who would ever say that? I've seen that happen, um, where a set of pastors were talking with one of my students, and I was there also to try to, uh, try to assist, and they were trying to exhort her to be, stay in this abusive situation because it followed after the pattern of Christ. So there, there are ways that contemporary scholarship is critiquing uh, weaknesses or poor lines of thought within the tradition. Without that, uh, you're really, you're missing a huge resource. Um, so yeah, the, the, the two, the contrast between the two is what's so lively and so much fun. Yeah. I was, I was, I was thinking the same thing that it, it, it never would have occurred to me how <sighs> delicate and important um, this father-son relationship is in the atonement. If I hadn't heard people say stuff like, "God the Father is clearly a jerk who's beating up his kid," yeah. which we don't believe. But if if you can't hear that. Uh -huh you're not going to be able to have an, you're not going to be able to, to plumb the depths of, of this sort of beautiful but fraught uh, inter-Trinitarian relationship uh, on the cross. Yeah, no, absolutely. All this, this is the same stuff that he covered in the last chapter of his book on sin, dealing with feminist theology now, how that helps the church. So same move. Yeah, 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 it's good stuff. Um, so in your first book, and again in the guide for the perplexed, you insist that the atonement be linked up to the doctrine of God. How does that work? Um, and why is it important? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so when I was a sophomore 
here at Biola, the, the director of the honors program, just as he was passing me said, Adam, you should be a theologian. <laughs> and at the time I was a philosophy major and I thought, I'll, I'll translate uh, for, the, for the sake of polite company. Uh, I thought, heck no, theologians are boring. I thought the same thing at college. I swear. No, I thought I don't want to have to do anything to do with the Bible and theology. That's so boring. No, no, I, I, they're, they're terribly boring. And we were right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Present company included. Uh, uh, the, the, reason, the reason for that is the theology that I had, had been exposed to thought in terms of um, you, know, you have your different doctrines mm -hmm. and within each of the doctrines you collect the, the Bible passages and the relevant insights and, and, you, you, and you explain the doctrine. So that you, you know, you have your doctrine of creation, you're going to go to Genesis 1 and a few other passages and, and make your arguments and there you're, you're, you have your, your, your doctrine and then that can help you think about other things, right? Um, well, that sort of process of finding, collecting, collating, assembling, and then uh, look what I have um, is insanely boring uh, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I just hadn't seen theology done in, 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 in a different mode of thought. Uh, so, so between my dad and Fred Sanders, they, they kept on pushing me to read Karl Barth. When I encountered him, um, that was one of the other huge like conversion experiences within my life as a theologian. Um, as I, I remember uh, reading Bart. It was um, January of 2003. Uh, sorry, 2004. Uh, it was Reuben had just been born. Sorry. Oh, that means it was January of 2005. All right. He'd just been born. So, no, you were born in four, but it was to January of 2005. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. <laughs> uh, so he he was about this big. And we I had him wrapped up in his little blankie and stuff, and he was lying on the table sleeping. And I was there with the, um, Bart's Church Dogmatics, Volume 4, Part 1, reading this thing. Or he'd be down on the floor. We might have been reading it the same month. That's yeah, awesome. Right, right. That's awesome. So, okay, so, so he'd be sleeping there, because what else is he going to do? He's, you know, two months old. And I, I'm reading the dogmatics. And like every second or third page, I, I'm getting goosebumps, and I'm jumping around the living room, because he's teaching me a way of doing theology differently. And, and what's different about how he does it is that he demands that you think about doctrines not in an isolated fashion, but as they relate to each other and shape and inform each other. So he'll say, look, you want to think about the doctrine of creation. Great. What is the origin of the doctrine of creation within the life of God? So how does the doctrine of the Trinity shape what it means for creation to be creation? Because creation is the creation of the Creator, but the Creator is the triune God. And the fact that it's the triune God who, all, whose, whose works these are shapes the meaning, the significance, the direction, the purpose of all these things. So he was demanding that I, was, that I think between things rather than straight down the row. And th th that's what I love doing, and you, you'll see that in class all the time, as I'm asking, you know, how do, how, do, how do we use this topic to think about this thing? I'm always moving like that. Uh, it's because where things, it's at the intersections and at the joints that, that um, topics get, become most interesting. Mm -hmm. So with this, um, to think about the atonement in light of the doctrine of God, you'd think, well, yeah, who's going to describe the work of Jesus apart from the, apart from the fact that this was God's work? Well. They'll do that, but they'll do that when they have to. So, so it's one thing to say, okay, I'm describing my doctrine, and then when I get stuck, I'll resort to thinking about this other doctrine. Um, kind of like you're going along your, your merry little way, and you think, oh, when I get stuck, I'll call on my friend. But to think, what does it mean to live life based on and accompanied by a thorough vision of the nature of friendship as a calling of the church? That's a fundamentally different enterprise. Um, so, so what I was trying to do here is think, how does the doctrine of the Trinity, how does the doctrine of the divine attributes, and then something I want to work on more is how does the doctrine of election shape the, the, the meaning, the shape, the, uh, the, the parts of the doctrine of the atonement, and uh, the results just kind of blew my mind for a few years and are still doing that. Would you say, so I just heard you use the phrase, um, you talked about the atonement's origin in the life of God. Yeah. Um, you go further in some points, and, and, and uh, let me think of the right word for it. You pick a fight uh -huh. with some people um, by saying not just that the atonement has its origin in the life of God, but that the atonement is an event in the life of God himself. Yeah. Now that, I mean, we, we know a conversation we can get into right anyway. I'm not looking for that conversation. Yeah, but, yeah. but can you talk a little bit about what you mean when you say it's an event in the life of God himself? Yeah. Um, okay, so this is one of the images I, I tried to develop briefly in the book. 
Uh, because of Philippians 2, we tend to, and other passages like it, we tend to think of the incarnation as God coming down. Right, it's just downward motion. So um, the, we, we're supposed to have the mind of Christ, who though he was God and, and, and with God uh, and shared in the glory of God, did not consider that to be a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and humbled himself and took the form of a servant. And not only that, but led a life that, that, that was destined towards death. Right, that's, that's my transliteration of Philippians 2, right? So it's, it's a downward movement. Um, but there's a, there's a funny little problem with that. Um, what's down for God? And if you're everywhere, it's kind of hard to go down, or to the left or the right, isn't it? Um, so, so down is, is, an, is, a, is an image meant to convey something about the character and action of God. And in this case, it's trying to say that God, and especially the eternal Son, is a humble God, a God willing to condescend, willing to make himself a means for us, a means to our benefit. Right? Um, so, so it's useful to think of the downward movement, but not that useful. But if it's useful to think about a downward movement, can we reverse that? Is it an upward movement? Uh, and in fact, I think it is. So the incarnation is an elevation of humanity into the life of God. One of the Trinity became man. Now that could mean the Trinity descended to our level, but it also means we were brought up to his level. So Jesus, as he's living his you know, human life, we think of him down here and you know, the Father and the Spirit up here maybe. Just as uh, helpful as to think the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have always been relating to each other in a life of love, the Son became incarnate, bringing human nature up into the life of the Trinity, and the Trinity took on a new way of living out its triune life as Father, incarnate Son, and Holy Spirit. That means that everything Jesus is doing is an event in the life of the Trinity. It's the eternal Son doing these things in his human nature, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of the Father. This is the Trinity doing its work. Um, so, so that's the bare bones version of it. And then the reason God would do that is by bringing the human nature up into the divine life. He was also able to bring our sin up into the di divine life and deal with it at that level rather than just destroying us as he'd done in the flood uh, or in judging Israel or the other nations, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's the really short version. So thinking about the incarnation as an upward movement so that God's bringing something new into the divine life. Oh, that's nice. I, I remember in, being in a lecture once to a bunch of art students and it dawning on me in, in mid-sentence that as of the incarnation and, and particularly the resurrection, at this point, if God decided to annihilate the cosmos, it, he would be committing suicide. That, that, that he would cease to exist precisely because he has assumed humanity into himself and the yeah. second person of the Trinity is, is now incarnate for good. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah, that's kind of blows my mind. And, and that that was always his plan. So Ephesians 1, 4 says, we were elected in Christ. So, so the, the, the purpose of being Jesus was at the root of all things. Uh, so the purposes of election happened in a sense, in Christ, that God wanted this first and everything else in that. So he always had this plan of becoming Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but that's, oh, that's fun stuff. Nice. Um, I want to get to, so you've got these five diagnostic questions. Okay, so he, good. He offers for any theory of atonement. Here they are. <laughs> One, what's the case? Uh, what's the case? What's the case assembled? Does that sound right? Did I write that down wrong? Yeah. Sorry. Hold on. Thankfully, I have this right here. Cast. Questions. <laughs> this is my cheat sheet. Cast, cast. I was typing quick. What's the cast assembled in this work on the atonement? What divine attribute or set thereof does this particular theory of the atonement emphasize? What aspect of our sin does this particular theory focus on? Four, how does this theory develop Christ saving us from sin? And five, how does this theory develop Christ saving us for life with God and others? Would you run a couple of atonement th theories through those five questions, just really quick? Just pick a couple so they can see how it works. Okay, okay. If, if you need your questions, I know you wrote them, but I forget stuff I write. So. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, okay, so penal substitution. We'll start there. That's the one you're probably most familiar with. Um, so the cast within penal substitution is God the Father, the incarnate Son, ourselves, and to a, to a lesser degree, Satan. So the best way to think about, the, one of the ways to think about this is Narnia, all right? So you have, you have us in the form of Edmund. Um, you, have, you have Satan 
who's the one, or, or the white witch, who has you know, these rights over us. Um, you have the emperor over the sea, who plays a very muted role, but is presumably the one who wrote the deep and the deeper magic. And then you have Aslan. Aslan volunteers to take the, the, the penalty of death in the place of Edmund, so that Edmund can go free, so that we can go free. Um, and in doing that, the witch thinks she triumphs, but in fact, she doesn't triumph because there's a deeper logic that one innocent one dies in the place of a victim, then death itself will work backward, and, um, and, and then, that, that, then you have the, you know, the, the unfolding theory. So the idea there is within that cast, you have the Father, the Incarnate Son, ourselves, and to a muted role, Satan. Um, and the, the, whole, the whole logic in this particular way of thinking is a matter of justice. So when we, when we sin, we, we sin against a, a God who is just, that's an act of injustice, calling for penalty. Um, Satan is the one who is the accuser and rejoices in the penalty that we incur through his temptation. Christ steps in, bears that penalty in our place so that we can be free of it, and, and, and through his resurrection establishes us in lives of justice by means of which he triumphs over Satan. Right? So, so that's, that's the cast um, that also emphasizes the divine attribute, which is justice. Uh, the aspect of our sin is guilt. How does this theory develop Christ saving us from our sin? He bears our guilt and punishment for us so that we don't have to and suffers the consequences of it. And it develops his saving, um, Christ saving us in that through his resurrection we're established in lives of, of, of justice or, or righteousness. Now, there's an entirely different way of developing all that material. Um, and l l let's just run, let's r run with, uh, with the logic of shame for a moment, okay? So this is a shame theory? Yep. This is shame, a theory, theory? Of, okay. shame, shame theory of the atonement, <clears throat> right? Um, God, God is one who, who is a holy and full of honor, right? So when we sin against him, we sin against him to our great shame. Adam and Eve, first thing they do, cover themselves up because they felt shame. So the whole, the whole point of the, the whole problem is we are, shamed, we are shamed, therefore we hide ourselves and try to cover ourselves. You can unpack the whole gospel that way. Um, what does Christ do? Christ comes, enters, bears our shame, um, and in our attempt to hide from God, suffers the full reality of that. You see that's where art comes in that's really helpful, where Christ is crucified naked. Like you feel the visceral shame of that, of that event. It's, not, it's, it's gross to see. Like you don't want to see your Lord naked on a cross. Uh, but then through the resurrection, he is clothed in glory and, and given a name above all names, a name of honor, so that we in him are honored. It's, all, it's, it's, the, same, it's the same logic unfolding, but it's put in an entirely different way. And the, uh, the fascinating thing about that is that it opens up a whole set of new... Um, images and passages within scripture that you don't normally think about. Like when you think about Christ's atoning work, you don't normally think, oh yeah, Adam and Eve hiding because they were ashamed and they felt naked, because they were naked, and then sewing garments around themselves. You don't think that. But this line of thought demands that you pull that passage into the scope of your treatment about the atonement. Um, and it also opens up a whole bunch of pastoral resources. So if you're thinking, if you're, ta if you're talking with someone and you know, doing evangelism, or trying to help them with, with a lot of pain and grief, if all you can talk about is the atonement as a work of justice, but their, the, the primary problem that they're feeling is that of, of shame, you're speaking right, right across, right, right over the top of their experience. But if you can listen to the categories they're using, you can say, oh, okay, you're using lots of shame language here, which often takes the, uh, takes the form of swearing. Like they're trying to describe themselves and, and they don't have language for it because our mm -hmm. culture doesn't talk a lot about shame. Mm -hmm. So they're taught using foul language as things that are shameful. Mm -hmm. And you think, ah, okay, I can use this way of unpacking in the work of Christ to speak to this person's need. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, as, 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 you, as you become attuned to this way of thinking, you'll start seeing it, uh, treatments of the atonement, a little bit like music. It's, it's the same song or a very similar song. It'll be in a different key. Uh, with it or, or, or in a different meter, you know, so, something like that. But um, you learn to recognize those and the benefits they each have. Um, my friend Kristen took a job at Loyola University of Chicago and it's a Jesuit school and she talked about how uh, there's a really nice sense in which the Jesuits uh, let a thousand flowers bloom. Like you can be whatever you want when you're hanging out with the Jesuits. You can, hmm. you can think this, you can think that, you know, they got the communists, you got the neocons, I mean, whatever. And then they let a th thousand flowers bloom, and then just see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of let things things happen. Um, 
Is your approach to the atonement Jesuit? Small um, J. Obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Member of the Society of Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I was working with a pastor in the somewhere in Georgia. Um, just state, by state or country. State. That's a real question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and as, as, as we kept on, ta on talking, he, he said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to use this as a compliment. <laughs> he, he said, I love those beginnings. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. He said, I think you're helping me understand postmodernism, hmm. which shocked me because I'd never used the word in conversation with him, and I'd probably used it 10 times in my life other than this story. Right. And, uh, and I, I want to know what he meant, because I don't think of myself as a postmodern theologian, whatever that means. And he said, uh, when I think about something, I'm, I'm looking for the right answer. And every time we talk, you're looking for how you can bring in a multitude of things hmm. to help explain something. So I look for one thing, and you look for many. And, and his language for that was postmodern. Whether that's useful or not, I don't know. Um, there are few things I love more than, than, than pulling together um, a, a whole bunch of things into one cohesive whole. Mm -hmm. I find that immensely delightful and energizing. Mm -hmm. So one of it, it, it's partly just a personality thing. I love bringing things together. Um, partly it might be the theologians that so deeply shaped me. So uh, Thomas Aquinas was one of the first people that really helped me think about the atonement. Um, and he... He is so interested in trying to honor everyone within the tradition that came before him. I found that immensely compelling. And then the third thing is, um, and I wasn't able to develop in the book because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't realized this yet. Um, the atonement is God's work to reconcile all things to Himself. Like the goal is to create oneness within His discordant creation. So if I'm a theologian focusing on the doctrine of the atonement not only the content, but the method that I'm doing in exploring the atonement should be atonement-like. Mm. So not only the content should be right, the method should be right. And, and, and the method of atonement should be precisely that of atonement, reconciling all things. Mm. So I think the doctrine itself demands of me that I have this method of pulling many things together because that's what the cross was doing. Yeah. Our friend Chris would love that. <laughs> yeah, he would. Yeah. Um, it strikes me that, the, I mean, so, so here's, I think, the, the best thing about that. You're, um, you're particularly keen to rehabilitate neglected aspects of and resources for the atonement. Yeah. So, so could you, uh, let, what are some of the most neglected aspects? So I'm, I'm, I'll ask about Perfect. resources in a second, but aspects of the atonement. Oh, okay, that's great fun. Okay, so one of them I have a student working on right now. Um, Who's working on it? Tessa. All right. Yeah. good? I, I, so I just read her paper today, and, mm -hmm. I, and I said, hey, Tessa, I'll send you your comments later, but you probably like the last one. And it was something like, hey, fantastic paper. You have your dissertation topic if you want one. Nice. So, so anyway, um, do. Uh, so, so that's, that's the role of the Holy Spirit within the atonement. Mm -hmm. um, so, so everyone wants to talk about the relationship of the Father and the Son and the incarnate Son, and they all want to say it's a Trinitarian act, mm -hmm. but very few people within the history of thought want to say, what the role of the Holy Spirit was. Mm -hmm. Everyone says the Spirit applies the work of Christ to the individual believer. Mm -hmm. But what was he doing on Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday? Like just sitting back, chilling in the hot tub, or, you know, talking with the Father. What, what, what was he doing? He was Plastic Man. That's what, uh, uh, what's, no, what's the guy's name? What's the superhero? Elastigirl? No, no. The guy who stretches. Mr. Fantastic. No, no. Elastigirl. Plastic man. Yeah, there is a plastic there man. A plastic I think he was plastic man. <laughs> okay, I just changed. Okay, well, in the Incredibles, it's Elastigirl. Elastigirl. It is Elastigirl. Okay, you know. Yeah, Mrs. Fem Incredible. Feminine, feminine pronoun. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, all right. Um, so that, that's one of the most neglected topics. Um, there, so you, um, some theologians want to say that the Spirit is the bond of, of love between the Father and the incarnate Son. So that even though the Father is pouring out His wrath upon the Son who is bearing our sin, that there is not a full separation between them because of the work of the Spirit uniting the two. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one way of thinking about it. And uh, what Tessa and I, I guess and I are working on is trying to develop the, the role of the Holy Spirit in the life and death of Jesus Christ 
based on the parallel within the spirits relating to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. Mm. So the idea is that the spirit, as the spirit related to fallen Israel in the Old Testament, particularly toward the temple, and, and the spirit worked in judgment of sin, so the spirit was working within Christ who is himself recapitulating the history of Israel and fulfilling the role of, temple, uh, of the temple. The spirit's playing the same role in him that it played in Israel. And the spirit and, left the building. Exactly. Did spirit leave the building? Yeah. On the spirit, cross? Spirit left the building. Yeah? Yep, yep. And then the role of the Holy Spirit is yeah. then to, to restore Christ in the resurrection. So there's, there's a fulfillment in there. But anyway, so the role of the Holy Spirit is one of the most mm -hmm. neglected aspects of the, to, of the, of the atonement. Um, another one is the role of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, so, so one of the things that was immensely formative for me was a little article by Robert Jensen um, who said that within the atonement two main things have been neglected. One is the resurrection and the other is the Old Testament. Um, so what I try to do in this book is, even though I'm not using the resurrection in every paragraph, the whole thing is, is just dripping with the joy and the logic of the resurrection. And then a book I want to write later is the atonement as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. I'm, I'm playing with different titles. Either, 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 either it would be Salvation is from the Jew, or it would be the Consolation of Israel. I'm not sure which. Um, anyway, but um, so that's so th th really those three. So the resurrection, the Holy Spirit, and the role of the Old Testament. The, the one other thing I, I was thinking of just from your book is, is the implications for the non-human creation of the atonement too. So you want to make a, yeah. a deal about that, yeah? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you want to make a deal about that? Yeah, I want to make a deal about that. Okay. Um, Oh, but now there's too much to talk about. Um, okay, so there are, there are hints and whispers throughout Scripture that the work of Christ is not just for us. And as you begin to listen to those hints and those whispers and those echoes, you realize how big this work is. So, for example, you have, you have animals at, at creation, right? A bunch of them running around, and Adam's naming them all. And then you have a animals in uh, animal imagery, especially, when it comes to eschatological thinking lions and lambs and serpents and things and we'll be chilling with them and not, you know, not suffer any of the consequences of the fall. Now, symmetry sort of demands I, I, there to be animals at the cross, right? If they're there at the founding of creation, if they're there at the fulfillment, what, what does the cross have to do with the life of the, uh, the fate of the animals? Uh, Romans says that all of creation is groaning, right? So there are hints and whispers and then also hints and whispers within the history of theology that say, um, God not only became man, he became creature. And so, he, and, and as a creature, the fate of all creation is bound up with the incarnate creator. So that in a sense, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is also for the animals. And the best way to think of that, I think, is that their fate is the same as that of our bodies. Like they don't, they, because, in as much as they don't have souls that are like ours, their, their need for salvation is also quite different. But their, their need for salvation is that of moving from groaning to fulfillment. Uh, there's a fair bit of stuff uh, throughout Scripture talking about the fate of the angels. Uh, so in Ephesians and other places, angels are longing to look into this. Uh, Christ triumphed over the powers and the principalities. Um, it, in Isaiah, they're singing, holy, holy, holy. But in, um, in, I think in Revelation, they're singing, blessed is the lamb who was slain. Their song changes. So there's stuff throughout the history of theology exploring how, how, how was the fate of the angels bound up with this. Um, something I didn't develop in here, because I hadn't come across it yet, was that C.S. Lewis offers an account of how Christ's atoning work um, is saving for the heavens themselves. Mm -hmm. Because he took medieval cosmology with its um, geocentric model and adapted it to the heliocentric model. Now in the geocentric model, you have the earth in the center. Some of you are smiling because we played with this in class. The earth, earth is at the center and the heavens are making their song, right? But the earth is silent because it's still, it's in the center. But if you take a heliocentric model, the earth is one of the planets. So it too ought to be singing its song, right? Yeah, but the earth fell. So in the space trilogy, the earth is the silent planet. Why did Christ die? In order, in order, in order to overthrow Satan, establish himself as the Lord of that planet, so that that planet could rejoin the others in the music of the spheres. So Christ's death and, death and resurrection is cosmic in addition, you know, cosmic as in for the heavens themselves mm -hmm. and not just for us. All of that doesn't minimize the fact that he died for you and me and rose again. It just helps put ourselves in proper perspective and see 
This is the maker of heaven and earth making his whole creative project sing and rejoice and bring it to fulfillment. You're a part of that, but it's a way bigger scope. Anyway, there are some hints. So, 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 so one of the most beautiful things about how you approach the atonement and, and at least a place someone could lodge a, a question or objection is it's maximal. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely maximal. Um, I wrote the note to myself. I think I even spotted the kitchen sink in there somewhere. Uh -huh. I mean, you throw everything in the atonement. It was a nice one, too. Um, nice you, big one. <laughs> it was. You describe it as a uniquely synthetic doctrine. Um, I guess sort of the minimalist objection would be something like this. Um, well, the, I mean, I know it's an English word, so this is partly an English, an, an English language issue, but, you know, it shows up some and in some weird moments uh -huh. and not that much in the New Testament. And why burden our English word atonement so significantly? So if you, if you read scripture as a... As an, as an even recited uh, movement through an equally important set of topics and stories, if you flatten it out, uh, that, that helps you get a sense of the whole thing because you're giving each part um, equal weight and significance. There's also something tragic about that mm -hmm. uh, because scripture is not sort of a... Um, doesn't have the measured pace of an Iron Man who's going to be running 50 or 100 miles in a day. Or in a, in a, you know, I don't know how long it takes an Iron Man to run 100 miles. 36 hours or whatever. I don't know. Um, scripture uh, is, is more, like, more like a kid, right, on, on Christmas, right? So, so it, um, parts of it are wildly ecstatic and jumping up and down and the, all the significance of the world is laden in this one moment. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be a long part of playing, and there'll be some fighting, and 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 then there'll be you know um, some more furious activity. But but it, it, it's up and down, and, and it, so so we have to attend to those parts of scripture which take the whole thing and say this right here is the most fantastically important part. And it's like there are a whole, even though it's just a word or a little phrase, there are whole mountains of thought within it. Whereas an, another passage or, or even, or even a whole set of chapters might smoothly w work through a single argument, there will be a verse that then all of a sudden sends you soaring up into the heavens or all the way back before the dawn of time. So there are a few passages like that which talk about God's work as being a work of reconciliation, of reconciling all things to himself. That, th those, even though those words are only mentioned a couple times, I think they give us a glimpse it's, it's like it's like a it's it's uh, among a whole bunch of portraits. This is a is a is a whole a whole vista, not not only of the earth, but like but it's like, kind of like the map in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Um, it, it gives you the, the, the biggest possible perspective. I think that's what this word or this concept does. So this is a this is a synthetic judgment based on a reading of scripture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No verse is going to prove this. Um, why atonement, not reconciliation? Because I know that, yeah. so, so one of the key things about Dr. Johnson's work is he wants to say, oh my gosh, we're not going to pick one metaphor or one theory and yep. put all of our weight into it. Mm -hmm. But then he does sort of say, but if you had to fix one way to talk about salvation, let's call it reconciliation. Yeah. I don't think you're, yeah. you're going against your own grain, yeah. but, but you are saying, I mean, that's, you're, yeah. you're gesturing in that direction. Why not just make this all about the doctrine of reconciliation instead of the doctrine of the atonement? Uh, to, so to me, that's largely uh, semantic. Okay. Um, so if you if you if you want to you know if you want to fight over whether I'm a, I'm a, a jerk or a meanie, okay, okay. <laughs> um, you, you, you can be both. <laughs> you can be both. Um, so so atonement and reconciliation to me are largely are are, are effectively synonymous. At one meant the origin of the word is attune to make at one. It's a kind of a funny etymology within English. And then reconciliation has to do with bringing together two parties. But so, I mean, are Oliver and Joey, my parents' dogs, going to be at one with God? Are they at one with God? Or could you differentiate yeah. a little bit? So, so yeah, 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 I get yeah. the interpersonal. I'm happy to go oh, all yeah, the way yeah, yeah. there with persons. Yeah. But when I talk about the at oneing uh -huh. of sweet Ollie and Joey, they're the best. I mean, they're the closest thing to persons that aren't persons that I know. Yeah. Better than um, Molly and Mitchell? Uh, oh yeah, sorry, Julie. 
Okay. It's true. Um, but uh, our friend's dog. Yeah. But but it doesn't seem right to talk about their their being made one. Yes. With trying God to me. Okay. I can um, see reconciliation partly because there's some biblical, explicit biblical precedent. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I got this from both Wesley and Pseudo Dionysius. Um, both of them say something like this: um, Things are saved according to their mode of being. Mm -hmm. So depending on the kind of thing you are, that uh, affects and shapes and determines how you participate in salvation. Mm -hmm. So I would just say that, yeah, things are at, well, so, so, so these two wonderful dogs that I'd love to meet um, uh, will or may be um, at one with God in a way suitable and appropriate to dogs, which will be different from verse truly, um, but it would still be properly de described as oneness. Really? Yeah. <coughs> I. I now that's a good. That's a good long conversation we should have sometime because I do wonder about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see the reconciliation. I can see them having uh, their being in God, being sustained by God. There does seem to be a personal dynamic yeah. to, to a oneness. And then, so the way that Boethius tries to describe this is say that the, even the demons are made one with God, in the sense of, uh, according to the capacity of their being. They are made one with God. But as it turns out, for a demon whose will is utterly opposed to that of the maker, oneness ends up being uh, constraint and confinement. Mm -hmm. um, that, um, I want to ask, um, that's, I wanted to ask about resources too, and that's, okay. that's reminding me. So I hope you're getting a sense of some of the neglected resources that you might not have picked up on in the Doctrine of the Atonement. Here's Dennis saying this kind of thing. What, what are some other resources in the tradition or in scripture that have been neglected in traditional treatments of the atonement? Oh, man. Uh, okay, so if, if you understand Athanasius on the Incarnation, that, that is the vaccine which will inoculate you against 90% of the problems in contemporary discourse. Mm. So if only people would read Athanasius carefully, I think that would help them immensely. So that's one of the huge resources. Um, I, I wonder if he's got stuff in his letters to Serapian that'll help you on the spirit. That's on my, on my list. Okay. Yep. Um, honestly, uh, just the classics. Um, it, it, the things that we have you read in this program, um, like, you know, so Athanasius, Anselm, Calvin, Aquinas, Schleiermacher, th those books are going to be in any respectable treatment of the doctrine. Now, that doesn't mean that those people read them carefully. So if you've read Athen or, you know, Anselm on the uh, Cordial's Homo or Why God Became Man, if you've read that one or two times and read it carefully, you have an edge on most treatments of the doctrine of the atonement because most of them have only read secondary sources on mm -hmm. the topic and not actually engaged carefully with the text itself. So one of, the, one of the best resources I could give you in terms of developing the doctrine is reading back through the curriculum we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it really is. I find it so nourishing. And you find it, like, Boethius, not in standard treatments of the doctrine. Pseudodionysius, not in standard treatments. But these classics are so nourishing for the theological task. There's just nothing like them. Yes. So that, that's the best resource I have. Um, could there be such a thing as a genuinely new theory of atonement? Um, so there will be um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, um, like af after the cosmos took on a, after we gave the cosmos a, a heliocentric model, something genuinely new was possible that C.S. Lewis did that no mm -hmm. one's ever done, right? Um, the, the earth being silent just wasn't a problem within the medieval and ancient model because it was stuck in the middle. It wasn't supposed to be singing. So... C.S. Lewis in literature was able to do something that was genuinely new. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, there are hints and whispers throughout Scripture about the heavens rejoicing and the sun goes dark, and so it's talking about cosmic heavenly things and little whispers and things. So, is it completely new? Well, no. All it is is a testimony to what actually happened. So, is, is testimony a new thing? Well, yes and no. Yes, because no one said it before. No, because it's testifying to something which has actually happened and is the full thing itself. So, um, I, I guess I'd say I'd want to say, yeah, yeah, there are genuinely new theories of the atonement, as long as we don't mean we're making up stuff that didn't exist before. 
We're, we're witnessing to it in a way that's never been witnessed. Are there genuinely better theories of atonement? Worse? <coughs> How do you discriminate? So, I mean, so, I mean, if, I'm, partly I'm thinking of your Georgian pastor friend. I'm thinking of the Jesuit yep. question. Um, do you, can, can we talk about central and peripheral theories of atonement? Can we talk about um, strands that matter more? Can we... Do we need to say, well, you know, you're, you're fine and all, but you're just a bit part, and you, you're getting the lead here, or at least there's a few leads. Is that worth doing? Is it just Ill, yeah. misguided? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's worth doing. Okay. Um, I don't think it's worth doing, and I think it has to do with, with um, that's a scriptural intuition. Uh, mostly, though, that's a systematic um, conclusion. So the atonement is God's work for us, or God's work for creation. And the, the reason that theories are different from each other um, has a lot to do with the divine attribute that they emphasize. So uh, one will emphasize the lordship of God. Another one will emphasize his righteousness or his wisdom, his justice. And each of those kind of casts the whole stage in a different light, you know, the stage of creation. So we're thinking about righteousness. You know, there will be, you know, I don't know, a blue light over all of creation. And then you know, that will help you appreciate certain things you hadn't appreciated before. Mm -hmm. But then if you change the lighting, it's, it's all of a sudden it's yellow. Like, whoa, I didn't even realize those were pears and, you know, or whatever. Uh, like, you, you see and notice different things. Uh, so I think interior designers care a lot about that kind of thing. Like, the kind of lighting it really changes how you perceive the whole room. Um, theories are just changing the lighting. If we could have a theory which was just the white light of truth so we could see all things at once, that would be, that would be, that would be your, that would be your theory. The problem is, um, I think that would exceed human capacity, the, the white light. So mm -hmm. theories are different, rotating different colors of light, so that through that we can get a sense of the whole, because white light would simply be overwhelming. Uh, we kind of need heaven, as in Dante, as he ascends, his eyesight grows brighter and brighter and brighter, to be able to see the work of Christ's death and resurrection as it fully is. Okay. How has uh, <clears throat> your mind changed since you... So how about since you, since you wrote the first book, how's your mind changed? <laughs> I still have so much fun doing this. Uh, so, so the joy hasn't changed at all. Um, I, I can't believe I get to do this for a living. Uh, it's, 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 a little, it's a little too much fun. Someday I'll get, I'll get caught and they'll say you don't get to do it anymore. So that hasn't changed at all. Um, how Christ's work relates to all the different um, aspects of creation, so the kind of the hierarchy of being in Augustine, that kind of thing, or the different, different uh, elements of God's good creation. That's been all new. Mm -hmm. um, working on. And that's not a mind change so much as a like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. You know that what? Yeah. So, so the fundamental thesis has not changed since it all clicked as I was transitioning between my MDiv and my PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of my professors said, "Why don't you do with Karl Bart what you did with Thomas Aquinas?" And at the same time, I was reading Edwards, and I realized that everything, all the theories were different only because of the divine attribute that was emphasized within them. Mm -hmm. Those two things happened at the same time, and I said, oh, got it. Mm -hmm. So I, I showed up in my PhD with my outline, nice. and it hasn't changed at all. So um, all I've been doing is unpacking and exploring new territory using the th same thesis. Where are you most likely to change your mind, or, or where are you... Why are you unsure? Okay, the thing I most want to develop. So this, uh, okay, not, not develop, not develop. Unsure, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, flat develop. out unsure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm most unsure about the center. Um, uh, and and, and the, this, so I wanted to write my dissertation on how, what does it mean for Christ to bear our sin? Mm -hmm. like, how do you do that? Yeah. Like, I, I can't bear yours. Like, what, what does it mean to bear someone's sin? Mm -hmm. uh, that's right at the heart of, all, of the logic of this whole thing. Um, I worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, and punted. I said, okay, this is axiomatic for my thinking. Mm -hmm. It all hinges on this. I can't develop it now. I don't know if, I, if, if, if we're able to. It might be beyond us. It might just be that I need to be like this 80-year-old grandpa saint. Uh, the, after, you know, after living hopefully a holy life, maybe I'll, I'll be able to write it then. Um, that's the thing that, I'm, that I... So if I get, if I get one question... You know, if I, if I br get briefly carried up into the third heaven, mm -hmm. uh, and that's I'll, not ask, even, I'll ask that. And, and that's not so much like you could be wrong. It's more like, how does that, what in the world that does that work? That is the fundamental mystery that it all revolves around. And I have, I have hints and ideas I want to develop. 
uh, I, I have ideas, but um, that one I just have to say it's true because scripture says it is and I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, one last question, then we might, I think we'll have a few minutes for questions from you all if you'd like. Um, you get to be your own critic. Yeah. Um, best thing about this book. Uh huh. Worst thing about this book. Okay. Okay, best thing Everyone about Everyone should have a worst thing about a book. Like, I just figure someone's a, f a, a poor reader of their own work if they can't identify a worst thing. Okay, okay. Best thing about this book. Um, I connect the doctrine of the atonement to the being and life of God in a way that no one has in the history of theology. Nice. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that. That part wasn't hard, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kind of waiting for lightning, right? Um, I think that's what I tried to do. Uh, and, and maybe I'm just dead wrong about that or delusional or whatever. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, so I think I did something new. Yeah. Um, and, but I don't, I don't, I don't like, um, I like being an underdog and to say something that complimentary of myself is no, a little I think scary. You're right. Okay, so I try, that's what I tried to do. Uh, worst thing about this book. I think, um, The thing I'm, okay, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go a soft version first and then I'll go harder. Uh, the worst thing about this book uh, that, I, that I'm really most frustrated with about it is that I wasn't able to say much about the role of the Holy Spirit. Mm. Like, that just seems like an omission mm. so mm. powerful, but I just, I say it in there. I wasn't able to do it because no one had done it. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't have anyone to rely on. Try to do that. two things that no one's done in the history of the treatment of the doctor. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm really serious, though. I mean, it's it, yeah. It's, and, and there are people who have done work in this, yeah. and there's stuff where we can go to, you know, find sources and things. These are also but, tiny. What was it? Sixty thousand words was that the contract on this yeah. book? Yeah, which went, sounds huge. Sixty thousand words is a tiny book. Went a bit over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, honestly, uh, so this is a this is a theological proposal, which is meant to help you read scripture. But it is not defending itself exegetically. So there is a, ho a, a, a mm -hmm. host mm -hmm. of biblical work to be done. This just left almost entirely silent because it's a theological proposal. But theology only works if it's rooted in scripture. And so there, there are all these invisible strings in like an army of footnotes mm -hmm. that are just sitting there silently like glaring at me <laughs> along with a whole, any New Testament scholar or biblical scholar that reads it. I know that. And um, that's just a glaring, glaring problem with it. Well, and, and, and there's a, a beautiful chapter on a temple theory of atonement in the previous book where you so, do the work. I, I, yeah, and I, I try to. Yeah. I mean, it's just excellent and, yeah. and really rich. And so yeah. well, nice. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me ask you. And this yeah. is kind of this is fun for us. I mean, it's 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 friend time. It's uh, <laughs> you, and, and you don't, you know, p people it's hard to get people to spend time to think about your stuff with you. So it's really fun yeah. to get this kind of thing uh, in friendship. And he's, he's in the acknowledgement in both these books, but now those books are both carefully underlined. So Absolutely. That, that means a lot, um, as are his two books. We, we have a few, few minutes. Questions, thoughts? Let's start with, let's do questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, you said that Christ took on a corruptible nature. Yes. Uh -huh. And that's intrinsically associated with guilt, and that God cannot be pleased with anything, much less anyone who's not perfect. Yeah. And how is that tying with the Christ being a spotless man? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, so that's an area where I want to read more history of theology, and I think I want to pick a fight with it. All right. So, so you pick a fight with the history of theology, knowing that you're probably a fool, <laughs> but you have to in order to honor it. The only way to honor theology is to pick a fight with it. Um, but you do that with fear and trembling. Okay, so at some point, Christ, Christ um, bore or became our sin. When he did that, he became offensive to God. So whether he did that on the cross and somehow took our sin on himself, or whether by taking on human nature, he was taking on our original sin and our, and our guilt and bore that throughout his life, um, either way, you have this similar sort of problem. I'm inclined to say he, he bore it all along, 
because then I don't have the same theological problems of trying to explain how is guilt or sin transferred. He, he took it upon himself by becoming incarnate. But I know Augustine's not going to be happy with me, so I have some work to do there, and I haven't developed it yet. I'm still pretty young as a theologian, like brand new. But good question, you're spot on. Luther's got this bit where he says Christ is the greatest sinner. Yeah, and... He might say that Christ is the greatest and only sinner. He might say, and Bart, Bart says Bart something, yeah, the same, the same thing. So, so, yeah, so playing with that, yeah. Okay. But great, great, great question. Um, I saw a hand... Anyway, okay. You, you were really excited. Okay. Oh, so I have a great title idea for your book on Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, is there a pun in it? Because there has to be a pun. Oh, yeah. Okay. Atonement. It's all about Jew. <laughs> <laughs> It's on the list. It's on the list. <laughs> wow, I was going to say that you have the makings of a great father. Like that. <laughs> Some of the makings of a great father. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> I'm not sure I'll go with that one, but that's all right. <laughs> That was him. That was me. I just, I kind of have contention with that just because if God is outside of space and time, our understanding of that, mm-hmm. then how exactly could he destroy himself because he's eternal? That's well, so, so I mean, just have, having made the comment, um, whatever God's relationship is to space and time, um, as, of the, uh, as of the incarnation, the second person in the Trinity, uh, is in space and time for good, period. So, so however we, and this, and this is somewhat contested. I mean, I think most of, most of the classical tradition wants to say that God's outside of space and time. It's, it's way more complex, I think, than we think. Um, but whatever that is, we have to put an asterisk that says, yeah, but the second person of the Trinity is eternally incarnate um, from the point of the incarnation. And so uh, he's in space and time. And so for him to undo all space and time and all of its constituents is to undo himself and, and hence is my conclusion of suicide. There are two topics which will kill any theological discussion and investigation instantly. A bad formulation of predestination True. and the statement that God is outside time. Like both of them just cut it at the jugular and it's over and, and, and you might not acknowledge that for a few like for a half an hour or whatever but the conversation is over. Uh, and, 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 and that's because both of those, um, as they're normally done, are so, so, so deadly in the way that they're wrong that, that theology just can't recover. Um, and that's the key move. Yeah. I mean, one of the, you know, the, so, so Bart, who we both spent a lot of time on, uh, you know, Bart wants to say that, that, that God is the one who loves in freedom. And uh, he wants to say a lot of other things about God, but... But he's trying to hold together the fact that the God who made the universe is radically free with reference to the universe. He made it. He, he doesn't owe it anything. He, he doesn't, it doesn't call the shots in the relationship between God and the world. But, uh, and Gar, uh, Bart wants to see this in eternity in God's uh, election of Jesus Christ. He wants to say, from eternity, God has bound himself to creation. So it's utterly free. It never stops being free. But it's, it's the freedom that, that takes the form of radical self-giving love. And so the very, the very shape of God's freedom from creation is he's so stinking free that he can make himself a servant in creation. Uh, and that's obviously, it's about as paradoxical as you can get. But I think rightly to speak of God, you have to say he has this sense of uh, being outside, being free, being not, not being entangled in the world. But he's even freer than that. He's so free that he can entangle himself in the world. And that's the move that, that I mean, I think Bart does about as any, well yeah. as anyone in the tradition yeah. is. He says, that's how free he is. You think he's free by just saying that, you know, he's not entangled with the world, but you haven't gone far enough because you haven't seen his freedom that is seen in Jesus, which is a freedom to love and to, to bind himself. Um, Bart to Meditory people. next semester. So, yeah. We're going to have fun. Yeah. We're going to have fun. Yeah. Got time for maybe one more question. Anyone? Uh-oh. Dr. Schubert? Uh, when you were glossing that all, uh, all is a town, um, or all is included in the 
time that you talked about the demons. Um, uh, I'm curious what what uh, you're willing to say about how our um, unrepentant sinners are yeah. included in. Mm. Yeah. What? That's a great question. <laughs> All right, so it's a couple, a couple of broad strokes ways of dealing with this. Um, one is um, God did something for, for a certain group that he meant to save, and his work isn't relevant for any, anyone or anything else. So this is standard double predestination. God came in order to do a work for those he meant to save, and that's it. Um, another version of it <coughs> is that God became man in order to do a work which could be applied to anyone if they accept it in faith. Um, and then a third way of doing, of unpacking this is God came and did a work which in fact did change everything, but then um, because God wants free covenantal partners can be um, rejected and resisted as though it were not true. So and that one's a little tricky to understand, but it's the one I'm most interested in pursuing. The best way to think about it is the dwarves in the last battle. Okay, So they, they uniquely um, don't part away from Aslan into darkness. They're thrown in, thrown through the barn door. So they're forced into heaven. The same thing happens in the great divorce, right? The same, same sort of conceptual play. In heaven, so they are in fact in heaven. They, they, are, they are unable to appreciate and perceive and benefit from the reality of which they are a part and are unrepentant in that, or are, are, are wholly given over to not seeing it. So they experience the reality of Christ's atoning work as torture. That, that's the way I'm inclined to, to develop that. Yeah, that's just some good old C.S. Lewis. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.